Welcome. So today we're going to be talking about resilience and how we can cultivate resilience in ourselves and others. I'm going to drop in the chat a PDF um, that can help you kind of follow along and, and document any notes that you want. So I've dropped that in the chat. Um, my name is Megan Pollock. I'm based out of Dallas, Texas. I've had the opportunity to lead quite a few workshops for Bipsy, and I am excited to continue delivering these services. And I come to this work. I'm an engineer by training. About 12 years ago, I switched from widgets to workshops, and I've never looked back um, because I find so much rewarding. Um, it's just so exciting to get to work with people to intentionally engineer equity and inclusion into their organizations. Now, I think we're all pros at using Zoom by now, but I do wanna just give you a couple of highlights. So all of you have control over your audio. If I do mute you at any point, it is only to protect you. <laughs> it is nothing against um, anything about you. We want you to share your voice. And so you can, again, unmute at any time. I've activated the closed captioning, and so that is available. If you don't want to see it, you can turn it off. Um, I'm grateful to those of you who are sharing your camera with me. It definitely makes it a more engaging space for us. And let's see. I encourage you to liberally use the chat. And we're not going to be doing any breakout rooms today and not going to be using any annotation, but it is a good point to sort of check the participant list and check your name and make sure that the name that shows up is your name. Because sometimes if we log in on a different computer, it's someone else's name. And so just check that that's how you'd like me to call you. Now let's do some introductions. Introduce yourself in the chat. Um, actually, we've got a small enough group we could just do um, round robin introductions if you're okay with that. If you don't want to unmute and you just want to drop your information in the chat, you can do that too. Allison, Martin, do you want to go first? Sure. I'm Allison Martin. I direct uh, professional development at BIFC. Thanks, Allison. Allison, how about the other Allison? Allison, next. Uh, I'm Allison Hicks. I'm the student success coordinator at CLT CC Sabine Valley Campus. Thanks, Allison. I'm sorry I mispronounced your name. I just no read it <laughs> wrong. Hi, Kirk. Hi, I'm uh, Kirk Fontenot. I teach English and I'm the assistant dean of liberal arts at Bossier Parish Community College. Welcome, Kirk. Hi, Nita. Do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Nita Drost, and I do grants accounting at Bipsy. Welcome. Hi, Sandra. Do you want to introduce yourself? Crystal, I see you dropped in the chat that you are from CLTCC in Natchitoches. Okay, now you're challenging how much I can pronounce Louisiana terms. <laughs> Natchitoches? Um, Natchitoches. Natchitoches. Oh, wow, I was way off. <laughs> What's so funny is I actually think I went to summer camp there when I was a kid, but um, I was still really off. Welcome, Crystal. Uh, Stormy, we're just doing quick introductions. You want to say hi? Looks like her, uh, their audio may not be connected yet. Well, we'll come back to Sandra and Stormy um, later. So let's dive into the topic today. Now the topic is resilience. So let's first get our sort of neurons firing. What does resilience mean to you? You can share ideas in the chat, you can unmute. What does resilience mean to you? Maybe you're thinking about a time when you discovered you had resilience or you're thinking about a time you wish you had more resilience. What is it? So imagine that you had to explain resilience to a fourth grader. How might you do that? Sometimes that takes some of the pressure off of having like perfect answers. Any ideas? So Allison Heck says, always bouncing back. Yeah, that's a great definition. It's the ability to adapt in the face of any kind of difficulty, whether that's adversity, trauma, tragedy, or 
threats of significant sources of stress. Uh, so Kirk adds in the text, I think resilience means to be prepared so that you can withstand challenges. Yeah, so what we're gonna be talking about today is a sort of the practice of resilience. Resilience is absolutely not something you're born with that you either have or you don't have. This is something that we develop over the course of our lives. And we're gonna talk about what that means for us today. Now, biologically, resilience is a little bit different than maybe what we have been cons you know, considering what res resilience means to us. So we're gonna be talking about some of the biology of resilience as well. So again, biologically, resilience is that ability to modulate and constructively harness a stress response, right? So it's not all stress is bad, some stress is good for us, but when we can modulate that and constructively harness it, and that is, it's a capacity essentially to, to sort of both manage this physically and mentally. Now, I wanna give you an example of something that sort of come to mind. Uh, I am from Orange, Texas, so just across I-10. And yesterday there was a pretty bad tornado that went through some parts of my hometown. So it had me thinking about hurricanes and, and how it sort of ties into resilience. Now, this is not an actual photo from my hometown, but it reminded me of what Hurricane Rita did to Orange. So what did, did you all experience anything from Rita? Rita was 2005. It was the one that was right after Katrina. So it didn't get as much press because Katrina was so catastrophic to New Orleans, but Hurricane Rita, it was one of the most intense hurricanes on record and um, and it was just a, sh a month shy of Hurricane Katrina and so why I'm bringing this up is so southeast Texas is covered in pine trees we used to joke and say the sun didn't come up till 10 a.m because it had to come up over all the pine trees and in 2005 I was living in uh, Spain at the time and when I came back to the states and came to Orange and so this was like December of that same year I didn't recognize my hometown, this place where I had grown up. And it's because all of the pine trees snapped off like this, just the whole tops just snapped. And it was similar to another experience I had with the place that I've lived. But what was interesting is like, we, you had no idea what was in these forests because you couldn't see them. But now you could see, oh, well, people live back there. Oh, there's a building back there. Um, but it was really tragic. And so like the numbers and the, it was so catastrophic to my hometown because when all these trees fell, they fell on people's properties. And so they fell in people's homes and it was, it was really, really devastating. My parents were extraordinarily lucky. The house where I grew up in, the trees literally laid down like right next to the house. How this happened, it's quite, quite stunning, but most people had them inside their houses. And so what's different from pine trees as compared to palm trees is their flexibility. Now, another place that I lived is uh, in Puerto Rico. And this is an image of the, the view from the condo where I stay when I go down there, typically. And then this is the view right after Hurricane Maria. Now I was living in Puerto Rico right before Maria hit, like I left the day it was hitting, American Airlines was able to get me out. But what's so interesting is while you can see the damage here on the trees, all these trees are back and, and grown again. And that's the difference between palm trees and pine trees is that palm trees can bend and they're very flexible, right? So this is kind of like us and our resilience. Do we bend or do we break? So what I wanna challenge you to do is to think about some difficulties that you've experienced. So that will give us some, give you some context as we're having this conversation today. So the first thing I want you to do is to think about a difficulty that you had when you struggled to recover. And then I want you to think about a difficulty that you experienced when your recovery was like almost surprising to you. And then I want you to think about the difference. So you just give yourself to think about when's a time when you really struggled to recover from something, a time when you recovered pretty quickly and what was the difference? Speaking of wind, I don't know if you can hear, there's like a ton of wind outside my window right now, but um, it's going 
pretty crazy. I think that um, I have a huge crepe myrtle. I think they're quite flexible, actually. <laughs> they can bend a lot. Anybody have a, an example that you're willing to share? Uh, maybe of a time that when you didn't recover, you don't have to go into full detail, but just sort of highlights of an example and maybe the differences between the two. So I'll, I'll share an example of like the first sort of big trauma in my life when I did not recover well. So I was laid off from my very first grown up job uh, in 2009. So I'm an engineer and I got caught in the huge dip in the economy of early 2009. And it was really the first time in my life when I had been like, or what I had perceived as like a pretty intense rejection. Like, even though they tell you it's not a rejection and they laid off 42% of my business group, um, I still, I just took it so hard. And it really took me, even, so even though I started my doctorate within a couple of months, like my mental recovery, it just took me years because I was so shook by that. And then I think about some of the big life changes that happened to me after that. And I was surprised at how fast I recovered. But when I think about the difference between the two was simply that I had those other experiences. I had the perspective to think I survived that, I can survive this. And then every time I experience another trauma, I'm like, man, that's nothing, right? Like it doesn't make it not challenging while you're in it, but it gives me greater hope and, and realization that we're gonna make it through, all right? So we're gonna, I want you to kind of keep these questions in mind, thinking about the sort of milestones in your life when you have experienced things and when you've been more resilient or not. So my next prompt for you is to think about how do the difficulties that we experience when we really need resilience, how do they affect the body and our minds? How do the difficulties that we experience affect the body and the mind? Maybe just think back to the last year of, of, of 2020 depending on how your life was altered in the midst of, of that mess, what experiences did you experience in your body and your mind as a result of challenges? Any ideas? What are you thinking about? I, I have something that I saw on the news the other day. What's that, Raymond? It said that people, um, there's a lot more liver transplants going on right now. And the reason why is because a lot of people were drinking during COVID and have damaged their livers at a disproportional rate. And it's causing for more transplants. I don't know why I laughed at what you just said. It's not funny. But no, but I have friends that are experiencing just that. I mean, They've lost jobs because of drinking during COVID um, and damaged their body. You know, just different people I know. And it's, uh, it's a real thing. And I knew that before I saw it on the news. And then the news just kind of confirmed uh, what it is. And so definitely that affects the body mentally. You're, you know, you could lose weight or gain weight. Some people probably worked out like crazy people and then other people probably ate like they were starving to death you know over all that time but you definitely respond when you have something mentally affecting you exactly so all of the things that you describe whether eating or drinking or smoking the, these are all responses to stress or they can be responses to stress kirk what were you thinking about Oh, uh, I actually gave the example to my students this week when we were talking about life before and after COVID. I point out that this was not white uh, before COVID. Uh, I feel like COVID aged me. Uh, my, my body is not what it was, and it's all anxiety and stress. Um, and, um, but in my students, actually, they know I'm telling the truth because they can see like video lectures from me just a couple of years ago on Canvas when this was not gray and, and now it is in the, um, and also, you know, I was one who put on weight and not from eating, but just, I became lethargic, uh, being trapped at home and, and not being able to get out and, um, you know, 
taking my dog for a walk was about the most exercise I got a day uh, for, you know, a year and a half. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Kirk. And, you know, the, the gray hair is a common thing when you look at some of the younger presidents who weren't gray when they started all of them are very gray when they leave, right? Yeah. And it's because of a stress response that, that creates those kinds of changes. Tammy? I think sometimes too, you just kind of get in a fog almost, you know, like when my mom passed away or when um, last year my house burned down. Yeah. Um, it's just like, you just lose touch with all the rest of reality. It's like, it just doesn't matter. And you're just trying to figure out, um, like, you know, what am I supposed to be doing? What do I need to be doing right now? You know, right. like you lose all sense of what it's important in your other priorities. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because you're either just grieving or you're um, just trying to wrap your mind around what just happened. Yeah. yeah. And the rest of your stuff just becomes a, you know, it's just like a fog. Like, you know, you need to be doing these things, but yet it's like you just, can't get over there and grasp them and do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. It seems like a, it's weird. Yeah. Well, about. there's science that backs it up and we're going to talk about that. And um, I am so sorry that you experienced your house burning down in the midst of the 2020 shitstorm that we experienced. That's <laughs> exactly right. That's all I needed. We've been <laughs> home since March or whenever we went home and September on Labor Day, my house burned down. Oh my God. And so then we're like not working, we're displaced. It was just that much more, you know, complicated to figure out like our computers and all burn up. So I had to get another computer to work from home, which I wasn't even home. I had to go stay somewhere else. So it was just a lot to take in and it mentally does drain you and it just like it'll zap your energy. Yes. It and it will. just kind of puts you in a fog. It really does. Yeah. Well, so let's talk about kind of how that fog happens, right? So this is an image of a functional magnetic resonance imaging machine. We know them as MRI, but this is a functional MRI. And so it is a technique for measuring and mapping brain activity. So the invention of this machine, this technique was in the early 90s. Um, and so since then, we have developed a tremendous amount of understanding about the brain. And so in our brains, there is a function of neurons that's constantly fluctuating as we engage in different activities, either like simple activities like, you know, grabbing my water here, like our brain is, is involved in that, um, to also complex tasks of like trying to understand neuroscience, right? Um, and so in our brain, our brain is made up of about 10 billion neurons and all of these neurons look a little bit like this and all of them have the potential to connect and to more and more other neurons and so every time they connect to other neurons they are creating deeper pathways in our brain and how they connect well, I'm going to show you a video of some of the activity in the brain here in a second but so the cell body you see there um, in the center that kind of looks like a little eye there, it's not an eye. Uh, but as we develop and learn things, the cell body develops more and more what we call dendrites. And these dendrites then attach to other synapses of other neurons, okay? And so let's look at a, a really short video that's mapping and helping us to see brain activity. And as we watch this video, I want you to, to listen because it's going to tell us a little bit about the brain and stress. So listen for what you learn there. And then we're going to talk a little bit about that in just a second. Everything you see here is real data. We're looking through a microscope at neural tissue going down through an area of the brain called the medial prefrontal cortex. We can use these microscopic images to reconstruct the three-dimensional layout of the neurons and really see the intricate and intertwining patterns that they make. These connectivity patterns throughout the brain underlie all neural function and are responsible for everything from controlling your muscles when you tie your shoes to how you feel about your family. Understanding these patterns is a massive ongoing project for neuroscientists everywhere 
and could lead to breakthroughs for everything from consciousness to depressive disorders and schizophrenia. In this example, we injected purple dye into a far distant brain region called the amygdala, which is largely where our emotions and feelings of fear are generated. The purple wires are axons, or connections, coming from the amygdala into this area. We've also used some recent advancements in genetic engineering to select only the neurons inside this region that connect to the amygdala and dye them green. By combining both the green and purple dyes, we're able to see the full circuit of connections, viewing both the neurons that connect to the amygdala and connections coming back in from the amygdala. The locations and patterns of the neural connections, called synapses, show us how heavily these two groups of neurons are connected. To help us start to understand the incredible complexity of these neural networks, we develop computational techniques that segment or isolate individual neurons. By isolating a neuron, we can measure its characteristics, like size, shape, how many branches it has, and what general type of neuron it is. This may not seem like much, but it's really important for understanding so much about the brain. For instance, we know that malnutrition, stress, and cognitive disorders can all change how these branches look, but there are so many details that we don't know. That's why we, as scientists, keep pushing the envelope. To tackle these very complicated questions, we are getting together and combining fields ranging from physics and biology to mathematics and computer science. Every year, every day, we learn so much more. This is the most exciting and progressive time for neuroscience that there has ever been. All right, so in that video, I, I, I hope you like it. I think it's so fascinating to get to kind of see into the brain in that way. But it showed you not only lots of neurons and they tried to highlight the one neuron in the orange, it's, it shows how there are all of these neural networks. So not all of your neurons are connected to all of the neurons, right? Like they create networks in our brain that have different capacities and do different things. And so when we're thinking about this video, share with me was something that you learned from it? What's something that you heard in that video that was interesting to you? Any examples? So some of the things that stood out to me is that our neuron, our, the, the neural pathways, they control both our muscles and our feelings that scientists are learning what they're learning by studying the brain in this kind of way, they can help us address consciousness, depressive disorders, and even schizophrenia. And they've also been able to learn that stress and mal malnutrition, cognitive disorders, they can all change how our brain looks. And so let's talk a little bit about stress now. So stress is the brain's response to any demand. And that's the definition by the National Institute of Health. And so given that definition, not all stress is bad, right? It's simply a response. So how harmful it is depends on its intensity, its duration, and the treatment. So stress can take a variety of forms. Some stress happens as a result of like a single short-term event, like having an argument with a loved one, for example. Other stress happens due to recurring condi conditions like a global pandemic, for example, right? Or managing long-term illness or a demanding job. And so when these recurring conditions, when they cause stress that is both intense and prolonged or sustained, it can be referred to as chronic or toxic stress. So many of us have been experiencing a sort of chronic a, a period of sustained period of chronic or toxic stress since COVID has changed many of our lives. And so while all stress triggers different physio physiological reactions, chronic stress is specifically problematic because of the significant harm it can do to the functioning of the body and the brain. And so stress, what it is, it's this chain reaction in our brain and body. And the result of that chain reaction is cortisol. Anybody know anything about cortisol? How many of you had your doctors talk to you about cortisol levels? <laughs> It helps with that weight problem to bring it on. 
Yeah. So high levels of cortisol affect our weight. And what's interesting too about high levels of cortisol is it actually creates a greater tendency to gain weight around your torso, your middle. So when someone experiences like a stressful event, the amygdala, the part of the brain that contributes to like the emotional processing, it's sending distress signals to the hypothalamus. And that area of the brain functions like a command center. And so it's communicating with the rest of the body through the nervous system so that the person has the energy to fight or flight. Now, I'm sure many of you have heard that term, whether you understand the neuroscience of it or not, isn't particularly important. But, but why I'm giving you this explanation of stress is because understanding how we are experiencing challenges and what's happening in our brain and our physiology can help us have greater control over it, right? So when we are experiencing heightened emotions, when we are experiencing high levels of stress, by understanding what's happening in your body and what's happening in your brain, it gives you greater control over it. So that's why we're talking about it. So this fight or flight response, it's responsible for physical reactions that most people include, that most people sort of associate with stress, like heart rate, heightened senses, like a deeper intake of oxygen and sort of a rush of adrenaline. And so again, finally, at this point, there is a hormone called cortisol that is released and it helps to restore the energy lost in the response. And so typically when a stressful event is over, cortisol levels fall and the body reaches, returns to, to a stasis level. But that doesn't always happen, right? So when you're in these chronic st stress levels, your body's not returning back to that homeostasis. And so there are lots and lots of the stress effects of cortisol on the, baby, on the body. So high levels of cortisol, it can wear down our brain's ability to function properly. So Tammy, this is what you're experiencing. When you're experiencing high level of cortisol, your brain can't function. We have X amount of bandwidth. Your bandwidth is literally jammed with all of these things that's happening. You're trying to process too many things. You just can't think about a lot of other things. Um, so sort of bad news is, is that stress, when prolonged, it can actually kill brain cells. And if it prolongs even more, it can actually reduce the size of the brain. And so chronic stress ha can like shrink the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain that's responsible for memory and learning. And so there are reasons why we need to try to reduce stress <laughs> because it is particularly damaging to our, to our body. Okay, so I wanna offer another connection here and I offer this because it's important, but also I'm gonna offer it with some tongue in cheek here because how many of you deal with any kind of chronic pain? Or have at some point, have you dealt with chronic pain? It's awful. I'm sorry you experience it. I, I experience it. I broke my back um, as an overuse injury. I was a competitive power lifter for 18 years. And my, I broke my back and it's not stable and did all these surgeries and none of the surgeries worked and the, like my spine is still unstable. I live in chronic pain. So the tongue in cheek thing here is that a lot of people experience back pain. A lot of people who experience back pain are trying to relate to you. And I'm like, I have like mechanical issues here, but people always want to tell me like, you should de-stress, you should breathe more. And that's very stressful when people tell me that. So what I want you to hear me say is if you're experiencing chronic stress, I'm not saying that. If you have phys physical issues, those are true things that are happening to you. And there is a connection between stress and chronic pain that can heighten them. But in no way in offering this do I want to diminish the pain that you are experiencing. Okay. So um, somebody unmute. Did you want to add something? Who? Hey. Oh, I don't know. I just thought I heard some, um, somebody unmute. It's okay. Okay, so unchecked chronic stress, it can impair our immune system and it can contribute to chronic illnesses like gastric ulcers, asthma, depression, diabetes, and heart disease. And as Raymond talked about, stress, stress can also spawn unhealthy behaviors like smoking or excessive alcohol use. And so there is this stress and pain connection. And so this sort of 
complex relationship is that when we experience stress, it can, it can contribute to these sort of mental health issues. And so if you've experienced chronic pain, it's always on your mind, right? And if it's always on your mind, it's firing up neural networks that are again, connecting with other neural networks that can reduce your capacity and your cognitive control in other areas. So it's this give and take. It's they're deeply connected in these kinds of things. And so if you are interested in learning more about the sort of stress, chronic pain connection, I encourage you to look more into it. But a lot of the things that we're going to talk about are can also kind of be helpful for that. But for this one, the, the research says one, stay active as best as you can to sleep well and then find distractions from whatever pain that you have. Uh, but certainly seek a medical doctor's experience on these things. But again, they're still all very deeply connected. So let's bridge the conversation here. Now, why do people need resilience? Why do we need resilience? Oh, we wouldn't be able to bounce back. We would just give up, you know. I mean, you have to, to keep moving forward. I joke all the time that all these things happen to me because God knows I can handle it. You know, I laugh and I just move on. You know, it is what it is. And a yeah. lot of people can't do that. You know, a lot of people can't handle the stress and they just shut down for good or, you know, in a more destructive way, like uh, Kirk was saying. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Tammy. And Allison added in the chat to keep learning and moving forward. Right. I think the just the words moving forward is a great way to describe this is that if we don't develop resiliency, we can truly find ourselves stuck in our traumas and stuck in the experiences and unable to heal it allows our brains to kind of become trapped in those traumas and not able to progress. Raymond, did you want to add something? Oh, I was just saying we end up with the uh, Beetlejuice brain if we keep getting stressed out from what you said, our head, our brain is small and we can't really be productive and uh, enjoy and all the things we're used to doing. Yeah. So when all those things happen, you can't truly experience, experience the life that you want. So the ability to bounce back from setbacks is often described as the difference between successful and unsuccessful people. And resilience, it has been shown to positively influence work satisfaction, engagement, as well as overall being, and that it can lower depression levels. There is also evidence that resilience can help protect us from physical illness. And so resilience is important because it gives people the strength needed to process and overcome hardships. And so those people who are lacking resilience, they get easily overwhelmed. And they, again, they may turn to unhealthy coping mechanisms. And resilient people, they tap into their strengths and they tap into their support systems to overcome challenges and to work through problems. So Anna says in the chat, we also have to keep dealing with issues and problems in life. So you adapt and overcome. Yeah, it's constant adaptation and progression. So now let's talk about how we build resilience. Now, before I give you uh, the, the answers and the model here, I want you to think about for a second. So go back to the first set of prompts where I had you reflect on the time when you didn't have much resilience, on the time when you did have resilience, how did you build resilience between those two, those two events that you were thinking of? How did you build resilience? Okay, I'm going to attempt to talk. I have a really bad cold. <laughs> yeah, go so ahead. that's why I'm typing. Hey, everybody. <clears throat> I had a situation where I had zero, I would think, resilience. And it was probably because I was younger when I was faced with the issue. And it was when my parents divorced, they actually divorced when I was very, very young. And I just continued my entire life to deal with it. And I felt like it just dragged on forever until I finally, you know, when I was around maybe 23 to 25, around that time frame when we all kind of start really growing up, um, dealt with it, uh, you know, just with the therapy, finally talked to my parents about the situation. And I 
was able to overcome it, but I, I felt like it was kind of a lifelong journey that I was dealing with this issue of my parents' divorce when I was three years old. I mean, <laughs> it's like my whole life, you know, I was constantly dealing with it. And then through that therapy and through the, the letting go of that, it strengthened me. And then I felt like I was really resilient when I became a mom, um, from, sorry, my cold is like, from, um, just the physical part of, you know, you know, having children and then like being a mom, I felt like I was surprisingly resilient in that and have been able to overcome a lot of things in my marriage that not necessarily that my parents couldn't overcome but I just was very surprised that I learned a lot of lessons from giving the other um, issue of my life so much and then overcoming that and and actually what I did was pre-therapy before starting a family And so I was really happy with that decision because it helped me become more resilient, I would say. Yeah. Anna, thanks for sharing that. You know, and, and what I want to highlight here is that between the ages of three and 23, like your life progressed, you know, like you weren't standing still, you weren't stuck, but there was a part of you that was struggling with the resilience in that area. And that could have affected multiple parts of you, right? And how you trusted people or how you had relationships with other people. And so the same thing with the different kinds of things that we experience, that you may have some sort of undealt with traumas in one area, but you might build a great resilience in other areas, right? So resilience, you know, is different for different kinds of things that you're experiencing if you experience job loss you go through that once like you're like okay I'm fine like I'm going to make it through but that doesn't mean that you are going to be perfect in your relationships if you have other traumas there so again resilience is something that can be in different areas in our lives that we experience so I'm going to introduce a couple of examples of things and ways to look at this and so resilience as I mentioned in the beginning like and what we've all discussed is it's a skill It is a skill that can be nurtured and trained. It's the skill of like noticing our own thoughts and like unhooking from the unconstructive ones and then learning to rebalance quickly. So one model that uh, was introduced by Ken, Dr. Ken Gensberg, and he developed it. He's a pediatrician and he developed it to help children and adolescents build resilience But he says that uh, we can all build inner strength and utilize outside resources regardless of age. And so those seven C's are, and uh, they're competence, confidence, connection, character, contribution, coping, and control. And so if you're the kind of person who likes a list like that, jot those down. But we're going to talk now about some specific strategies for building resilience that likely filter into these seven cute little seven C's here, okay? So the first of the effective strategies, and these are not only strategies for us to build resilience, but they are useful for how we are teaching the students that we're serving. They're useful for how we support our colleagues, how we support our family, how we support our community. When we learn these techniques, we can, and, and one of the key strategies that we're going to spend most of our time at the end talking about is relational networks. And so that's the value that we get to bring to our relationships or helping them learn these things as well. So the first one is to calm the mind. And so when we focus on calming and clearing our mind, we're able to pay attention to what's really going on around us and what's coming up for you, right? So it's noticing and questioning how you're feeling and what's going on. And so what we do here is you're making a choice. You're making a choice to focus on what you want and what you choose rather than whatever doomsday scenario is pulling at you, right? And so this becomes a practice, again, of noticing those thoughts and unhooking from the the non-constructive ones. So you might develop mindfulness techniques where you are, mindfulness can take lots of different avenues for different people. Some people, you know, sit with like the music and and breathe. Some people swim laps, some people journal, whatever it takes for you to calm the mind, 
do that, right? That's the first thing that we want to try to do is to calm the mind. Now, the second one can help you calm the mind. And, and while it looks simple, I'm going to give you the science behind it, is to look out the window and to breathe. So there's a neuroscientist at Stanford, Andrew Huberman, and he studies the visual system. So our, our vision and I actually learned this when I was reading this, or I relearned it, of thinking about that our eyes are not just attached to the brain, that our eyes are actually part of the brain. They're part of that same central nervous system. And so they are basically an extension of that sort of cute pink thing that we keep looking at pictures of, right? And so that's how I want you to think about, you know, and understanding the science. And so stress is about how our eyes, and our breathing change in response to the world, as well as the sort of cascading events that follow. And so both of these bodily processes, our vision and our breath, our breath, these are things that are both physiological, but we can also control them, right? And so that's what we're trying to do here is we want to control our vision and control our breath because that changes the physiological reactions in our body. And so again, there's this growing body of research that makes a case that altering our breathing can alternate, can alter our brain. And so there's a visual connection when it talks to, I'm pointing out my window here, you can't see that, but like um, I'm on my second story. So I feel like I'm in a tree house and I, I've always set up my desks in front of a window and now I'm realizing the science, why that's really useful. And it's useful because when you look out it changes how your eyes are actually functioning. Functioning, When you're focused on a computer, so Tammy, when you were talking about going through trauma, like you actually get tunnel vision. So, you know, if you use like the, if you have one of the newer phones that has like a, um, the portrait mode on it. So the portrait mode on the phones, it highlights the central image and it blurs out the back kind of like my zoom is here our brains are functioning in the same kind of way we get a very myopic view and and focus on one thing and instead when we look out the window it changes how our eyes are functioning and it expands our peripheral and um, not to mention if you're looking out at nature that has its own great you know things that it does for our bodies so again with vision and breathing when we change our breathing, it's changing how much blood and oxygen is getting to our brain, right? When we are stressed, we begin to breathe lighter. We're not breathing as deep. And again, I encourage you if you wanna learn more about all the physiology of this, or you can just take my word for it and just look out the window and breathe. Um, Tammy says in the chat, you're very ADHD anyway. So when that happens, it only gets worse. You know, having blinders on isn't always a bad thing, right? Like sometimes it's a tool that can allow you to, to really focus on something. Um, and so sometimes we need to put blinders on. There's a book that I really love called, um, it's by Cal Newport. Oh my God, what's it called? What is it called? I'm forgetting the name of the book, but the, I'll tell you the whole point of the book is the point is, is that it's okay to like lock out all distractions and just focus on something. And why that's important is because that's actually how our brain functions. We think that we can manage all these distractions, but we can't. And so um, again, so if somebody wants to Google that, you can tell us what it is, but um, it's a great book by Cal Newport. Um, okay, so the next of the strategies is to set goals and reflect on progress. So if you are stressed or if you are moving through a traumatic or difficult event, it's really useful to create benchmarks and to set some goals, not like big goals that you have to like, that take a hundred steps, setting smaller, more proximal, that means nearer term goals that you can accomplish. So you are aiming for those small wins and then reflect on that progress. There are tons of tools that you can use or apps that you can use. There are just get a good old journal, whether you want to use your iPad or, you know, pen and paper. It's just setting some goals and reflecting on them. And if you, again, need something to scaffold for that, I have a tool on my website, the free tool that you can download to help you with that as well.
The next strategy from the research tells us that we need to connect with others through compassion. So compassion is that intention to be of benefit to others, and it starts in our mind. And so practically speaking, compassion starts by asking a question, how can I help another person have a better day, right? So it's engaging in sort of some acts of service, how it's engaging and it's, you know, activating sort of empathy and understanding. And so I, one of the things that I think we found useful, we people found useful in the course of 2020 is that we were, many people were experiencing it, right? So even though we felt so, some people, I say some people because like my parents' lives didn't change an ounce, but mine was like significantly affected. And so those people who were experiencing challenges, you could look around and say, there are billions of other people who are experiencing this, right? And so you were able to kind of have some compassion for yourself because so many other people were moving through that. And so if you are experiencing it, have greater compassion for other people. That means be nice to your servers at the restaurants, please. <laughs> okay, and the next one, this is what we're gonna spend the last bit of our time talking about is enhance your relational network. Now, people in our support systems can provide empathy or they can simply help us laugh and bolster our resilience by shifting perspectives and reminding us that we are not alone, right? And, and resilience, we're going to talk about here in a second, like, oh, I'll go ahead and show the slide. So resilience, it's not something that we have to find deep down in ourselves, that we can actually become more resilient in the process of connecting with others through our most challenging times. And so we're going to talk about some of those things. And so we can nurture and we can build resilience through a wide variety of interactions with people in our personal and professional lives. And I've always sort of joked, like it's, it's hard to make friends when you're out of college. Anybody ever experienced this? Because when you're in college, like everybody's in the sort of like sponge mode of like, I wanna be friends with everybody. But then as the older you get, people are more settled in their lives. They're more settled in their, whatever it is that they have going on. And it's really harder to develop those friend, friendship networks. And so I wanna first say that in reading in this research, like it acknowledges that it's not like a light switch. You can't just turn a light switch on and just all of a sudden have a tremendous strong network. You have to build that. And I'm not just talking like your LinkedIn professional network of, of people that you've met throughout your whole life. Like these are people that you have relation with, connection with. And one of the things that Alice and I have been uh, trying to do is to help create opportunities for you all to network amongst your professional colleagues to build some community there. That's the entire intent of the online learning community is to build culture, a culture of community, a culture of support. And so we encourage you to participate in those networking events that we have, and we encourage you to participate in the online learning community as well. So <clears throat> let's look at some examples of what this could mean in our lives and the different areas of where we need to look at and examine our networks. So this is an exercise to think about what are your top relational sources of resilience. So before I give you those things, I want you to think about, maybe offer in the chat, think about some of the areas, the different networks that you have and the kind of support that they offer you. Think about the different networks that you have. You've got your work network, community network. If you're involved in church, you have a, that network. You've got your family, your friends, and people add different things to your life, right? They're all sort of different pieces of your life puzzle. So the research breaks it down into eight different kinds of networks. And so I'm going to go over each of these, but I want you to be thinking as I go over them, which of these is most important to you? And then which areas do you have opportunity for some growth and building networks? Okay. So let's, the first one is called work surge. So these are connections that help us sort of shift work and manage surges. So, in, so I'm a, my business is very cyclical. 
So there are seasons when it's like lots and lots of work and the seasons when it's slower at work. Um, and it's harder for me as a business person of one, there aren't other people in my business that can kind of shift that. But what I do have is I have a network of other consultants like myself who have their own businesses that I can talk to, and then they can support me in those different kinds of surges. So whatever your role is, whatever it is that you're experiencing, find people who kind of share that capacity. If they can actually help take a load off of you, then that's great too. But sometimes we just need people that can just be like, yeah, it's a busy season. We're all struggling, right? So the next is around politics. So these are connections that help you make sense of people or politics in any given situation. And that doesn't necessarily mean like, you know, national politics. It could mean just sort of relational politics in your organization, in your community, um, how you are understanding other people, right? So maybe you have specific people that you go to when you need support in that kind of area. The next is pushback. So these are connections that help us find the confidence to push back and to self-advocate. The people that help us stand up for ourselves and to speak up and to, uh, to give our truths. The next is vision. So these are people that help us see a path forward. Now I'm halfway through and I want to make sure that you're still reflecting on these two questions is which is most important to you and which do you have some areas for relational growth. So the next one is empathy. So these connections provide empathic support so that we can release negative emotions. So these are the people that you go to and kind of just dump what you're experiencing on. And these are not the people that want to offer all the silver linings for you. These are not the people who say, yeah, but you know, you don't have it that bad. These are not, those are not your empathic support network people. The empathic support people that you need are the ones that are going to sit with you and hug you and love you and say, I'm sorry, you're going through this. We're going to get through it together. All right. The next group of people are the purpose people. These are the connections that remind us of our purpose and the meaning of our work, right? They are people that you can connect with uh, that share your own vision and passion uh, for whatever work that you're doing. It doesn't just mean what you're doing at Bipsy. The next one is humor. These are connections that help us laugh at ourselves or situations that we're experiencing, right? Even if you're experiencing, you know, a depressive state as a result of some kind of trauma, there's generally some humor that we can maybe find in it. And that can, again, help us in these, in these moments. And then the last one on the list is perspective. These are people who help us maintain perspective when setbacks happen. So sometimes the perspective people are the ones that are saying, that are telling you, okay, it's not that bad. Let's have a look at this. But you need both, right? I think about something you know, very personal that I experienced in 2020 is, and I think many people did as well, is I experienced a really, really deep, dark darkness in my life, right? My entire life changed from like, I've been a road warrior traveling for 10 years. And all of a sudden I wasn't traveling. It was five and a half hours from my family. Like it was just dark, y'all. All my work stopped. And so many people were experiencing this. And there were parts when I just needed empathy, but my friends were doing this. Oh, it's not so bad. It's silver lining this. And that is not helpful if you're in that. So you have to find both, right? And then you can find those people who can give you that sort of view of of life from a higher level that can help you see that and or maybe remind you of like hey remember when you survive this you're going to make it through just like that and so the these relationship networks that we build they it's unlikely that you're going to be able to maybe find one person that fits all of them these are lots of different people from different networks so we need lots of people in our lives so before you change gears today, I wanna to make sure that you think about which of these are most important to you and then which of them are most important to you that you really need to work on developing some relationships and make sure that in the midst of that, that you give yourself some grace and how you do that. So the, the steps are is one, you've got to determine what are your areas of resilience where you need resilient of relational networks that you need to grow and then what's your plan to do that? 
So these are the two key steps that I want you to take away. It's identifying who are the people that you need to add to your life and how are you going to find them? How are you going to build those relationships? And I do want to encourage you to participate in the events that we're offering. Um, so we have certain, you know, workshops like this, but we also have once a month just networking and community building activities. We've hosted a few um, and you know, full disclosure, we've received some feedback that people want it to be a little bit different and we want to hear from you, right? Um, and so if you can think of a way that we can help you build community, that we can help you build some of these things, let us know those things so that we can provide those for you. Um, before you again sign off today, I want to uh, thank you for coming and thank you for participating. If you go to um, engineerinclusion.com slash thanks, you can um, do a full um, evaluation. But if you don't have time for that, I'm going to pop open just a really quick satisfaction survey. But I do want to encourage you to, to do a complete survey because it'll give you some space to actually offer feedback. Um, but again, before you log off today, uh, just answer this quick poll that's open. And before we jump off, any questions or thoughts that you want to offer to the group before we all go back to those jobs this afternoon? Any questions? Any ideas that you want to share? I wish I could have all those things in like a couple of sentences to say to a person that included the vision and all the things, just like, does that exist? Um, wait, which, what do you want to have one quick thing to say to them? To take your whole pie chart and put all of those things into one expression. Relationships, community. I mean, that's kind of the simple thing. Now, what I am going to do with this content is I'm going to turn this into an asynchronous sort of course that you can um, listen back in, and I'll provide a little bit more resources. So Raymond, make sure that you're on the Center for Teaching and Learning. And then I am going to take up your challenge of like, how do we simplify that, that last wheel um, that you can take that away? Yeah, I'm really saying your friend comes to you and you don't know what the thing is that helps them out. So you have all those things lumped into one sentence. Well, you can paragraph. sometimes just ask, like, how can, what do you need right now? Like, do you need me to listen? Do you need me to problem solve? Do you need me to give you perspective? Because people generally kind of have a sense of what they need. We don't have to be able to read minds. You just so, made that too easy, Megan. <laughs> Ask, right, such a simple thing. Ask people what they need. All right, so again, stay tuned to the CTL. Um, we'll add the resources up there and you can tune back in and listen to this if you want. And uh, it will also be on YouTube, so you could also share it with other people. And uh, with that, again, just thank you for your time and thank you for sharing your stories. It's much more fun for me as a facilitator when people engage. So thank you for that, I appreciate it. <laughs>